I've had shortness of breath just for a couple of days. Is that serious? I'd like to send you to hospital. Today? Um, we've got a whole load of friends coming around tonight. My wife's got a whole load of food ready and we've got some... Shortness of breath there. is among the most common acute presenting complaints. It has an enormous differential diagnosis and a focused history is key to unpacking the correct diagnosis. My name is Dr Ali, a doctor in the UK's National Health Service and a medical educationalist. Keep watching and see if you can get the diagnosis correct. Good morning, my name is Dr Ali, I'm one of the doctors here. Hello. Can I first start off by confirming your full name and date of birth, please? Yes, Perry Evans, uh, 3rd of March, 1960. Nice to meet you, Perry. Can I call you Perry? Mr. Oh Evans? yeah, Perry's good. Yeah. Everybody calls me Perry. How can I help you today? Uh, well, I've had kind of shortness of breath mm -hmm. a couple of days. Um, I wasn't going to come and, and, and bother you, but my wife insisted. She said, oh, you've got to make an, an appointment because it uh, could be something. So, so here I am. Okay. Well, you've had shortness of breath for two days? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And your wife is concerned. Can you tell she me? worries a lot. Oh, okay. Tell me a bit more about this shortness of breath. Well, it's there all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't bother too much about it, but just one of those things, I guess. So it doesn't come and go, it's persistent? Yeah, more or less. Does anything make it better? No, no. Anything make it worse at all? No. Moving around, exercise, does that make it worse? Well, I'm not moving around much. You know, I had this I had an operation, so um, I'm pretty static most of the time. Oh, okay. When, when did you have an operation? Uh, three weeks ago, I had a hip replacement, right, the right hip here. Okay. Did everything go well? Apparently, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. But uh, great. I'm resting a lot. But was that for osteoarthritis? Yeah. You had the... mm. Okay, oh, that's great. So you, you've not been at, you've been mainly at home and not moving around. That's right. Okay. With this shortness of breath, do you feel unwell? Do you, do you feel like you've got a temperature at all? Uh, slight temperature, maybe. Mm. Nothing very much. Okay. I haven't measured it. You've not measured it. Okay. Have you coughed anything up? No. Okay. Do you have any pain in your chest? If I take short, uh, sorry, if I take a deep breath, mm. I get a sort of sharp pain. Mm, okay. Is, is that everywhere? Yeah, sort of generalised around there. Yeah. And this this sharp pain, what it feels like a stabbing knife or a, a dull ache? Or... No, it's a, a stabbing knife. Stabbing. Yeah. Okay. It's when I take a mm. deep breath. Mm. <laughs> Just did that. Oh, sorry. And how long have you had this pain for? A couple of days. Mm. Okay. Have, have you coughed up any blood at all? No. Mm. Do, do you have any pain anywhere else? I get a bit of pain in my leg. Mm. It's sort of, I would say, the lower up down there, you know, mm. the, it's the calf, isn't it? The calf. Around yeah. that, yeah, a bit of swelling, and there is some pain there. Okay. And the, the, the site, the operation site is fine, is it? No pain in the operation site? No, no, they, it's mainly uh, the I've, seen, I've seen the, the surgeon again. He said it's all yeah. uh, doing very well. So how long has your lower leg been swollen and painful for? Uh, a few days. A few days. Okay, so along with this shortness of breath. Yeah. So, so just, to, just to clarify, you've had this shortness of breath for two days with this sharp chest pain and you've got lower leg swelling. Mm but you've not coughed up any blood and you think you may have a temperature. I think it's just the aftermath of the operation. You know, the body takes a long time mm. to get back, doesn't it? Mm. I'm not bothered by it all. Do you, do you feel your heart racing at times? Yeah, I do sometimes, yeah. Um, I've got an Apple Watch mm. and uh, it does beep at me sometimes. Mm. What sort of figures are you getting on your Apple Watch? Uh, 100, over 100. And has that been at rest or when you're walking around? Um, all the time. All the time. So even when you're resting, you're watching the TV, it's, it's above 100? Yeah. Are you sleeping okay at night? Yeah. Are you using more pillows to sleep or does it make a difference? No, I don't know. Just the usual, just one pillow. Are you waking up breathless at all in the middle of the night? No, I sleep pretty well. You sleep pretty well? Yeah. Okay. Apart from this osteoarthritis that you've had a hip replacement for, do you suffer from any other medical problems? Uh, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. What do you take for that? And a lot of pain. Is that five milligrams once a day? Yeah. yeah. And have you, just a routine question, have you ever had a blood clot in your lower legs or your lungs? No. Yeah. 
you suffer from asthma, eczema, hay fever? No. And apart from the amylodipine, do you take any other medicine? Yes, um, the surgeon said to take cocodamol if I got a lot of pain. So I do take that sometimes. Mm. But only when it's bad. Only Not, I don't take it all the time. Okay. And any drug allergies or are you allergic to anything? No. Do you have any family history of any conditions, any illnesses or diseases? Well, my father had a heart attack. Okay, I'm sorry to heart hear disease, that. Heart disease, yeah, yeah. How old was he when he had a heart attack? 70 something. 70 something. Any other chest problems at all? No. So you said you, you live with your wife yeah. um, because she was concerned and That's she right. told you to come in. Yeah. Do you, is it, your wife, is she in good health? Yeah, she's good health and uh, we both look after the cat, oh. Tubby. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you want to see a photo yeah, of the sure, cat? Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's that lovely. Her. She, she yeah. likes to sleep in our bed. Oh, I know it's lovely. unhealthy, but... Yeah, you know. oh, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you live with your wife and your cat. And um, am I right to assume that you've not travelled anywhere because you've, you've had the operation? No, no, well, exactly. I've had the, the operation, yeah. And what do you do for a living? I'm in finance. I mean, I'm not working at the moment because of oh, this, sick, yeah. but uh, I work in finance, oh. mortgages, all those sort of things, pensions, okay. uh, investments. Okay. And do you smoke? No. Do you, do you drink alcohol? Hardly ever. And what were you hoping I could do for you today? Well, I was hoping you'd perhaps give me an antibiotic if, mm. if maybe I have an infection, okay. um, that sort of thing. I'll, I'll come to that shortly. Mm -hmm. I'd like to listen to your chest, uh, listen to your heart sounds, do your blood pressure and check your lower leg swelling. Okay. okay. Perry Evans had a two day history of constant shortness of breath at rest as well as on exertion. He had pleuritic chest pain with unilateral calf swelling with a recent history of orthopaedic surgery. With all these leads, the diagnostic workup here should be to exclude a PE. There isn't much of a differential here because the leads are so strong, so the better the leads, the narrower the differential diagnosis. Before we discuss further, have a look at the following differentials of dyspnea according to onset. Harry, thank you for coming to see me today. I have to say, I do agree with your wife. She was quite right in making this appointment. Don't tell her that. <laughs> Given the fact that you've had this shortness of breath, these chest pain, your heart is racing, and you've got this lower leg swelling, I don't think you have an infection. I think you've got something a little bit more serious going on. Oh. I do think you may have developed a blood clot in your lung. Oh, is, is that serious? So it, it can be, if left untreated, it can be serious. We've picked it up early and you can get medicine and it's curable. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to send you to hospital today to have an urgent blood test. Today? And a scan. Um, we've got a whole load of friends coming round tonight. My wife's got a whole load of food ready and we've got some champagne to, to congratulate the fact that my uh, op went very well. Can, can I, well, I'll go to A&E tomorrow if that's okay. I'm sorry to ruin your plans, but if left untreated for too long, it can be fatal. Oh, okay. Well, I better go then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll go now. Will you tell my wife? I'm happy to call your wife. I was joking. I'm not, I'll tell her. Okay. okay. Now, PEs can be lethal and should never be missed. But the reality is that PEs can be very difficult to diagnose, as it can present with virtually any cardiorespiratory symptom or sign, depending on its location and size. I'd like to mention a very sad case that happened fairly recently. 30-year-old. Emily Chesterton presented to a healthcare professional with calf pain and breathlessness. After a short appointment, she was diagnosed with a sprain and possible long COVID. She was told to rest and take paracetamol. A week later, Emily began to feel very unwell. Her leg was swollen and hot as she struggled to walk a few steps without becoming out of breath. She then presented again, but her legs were not actually examined. Emily was told that her breathlessness was due to anxiety and long COVID and was prescribed a Panelol for the anxiety. Later in the evening of that same day, Emily's health deteriorated while she was out for a meal with her partner and parents. They called an ambulance and Emily suffered a cardiac arrest on the way to hospital. Now 
the coroner concluded that Emily died from a pulmonary embolism and that had it been recognised at either presentation, then she probably would have survived. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this case is not to highlight somebody's mistakes, but to learn from it. Learning and reflection is a critical aspect of medicine because, let's face it, the stakes are just too high. In regards to diagnosing a sprain, I always say that a minor illness can only be diagnosed when all the complex stuff has been ruled out. Now, what stood out to me was on the second presentation, her legs were not actually examined. It's crucial to engage all our senses. I mean, if someone is complaining of calf pain, actually look at their calf. And sometimes the discrepancy can be quite subtle. So I always keep a, I always keep a tape measure in my doctor's bag and we measure the calf. So what were Emily's significant risk factors for PE? She had breathlessness, calf pain, recent contraction of COVID and PCOS. We know that COVID-19 is prothrombotic and therefore increases the risk of developing venous thromboembolism. And PCOS appears to be a risk factor for VTE, independently of its associated excess weight and greater use of combined oral contraceptives. Now the classic textbook triad of PE includes pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea and hemoptysis. However, we know from experience that only 10% of patients present like this. And small PEs are often missed because they cause pleuritic chest pain without any other findings. So which features make pulmonary embolism more likely? So there was a study called the PIOPED study in 2007, which looked at the frequency of different symptoms and signs in patients who were diagnosed with a PE. Now, the relative frequency of common clinical signs were tachypnea at 96%, crackles at 58%, tachycardia at 44%, and a fever at 43%. When you suspect a PE, you really should see the patient face-to-face -face and do a thorough clinical examination and request a chest x-ray to exclude any other pathology. If a PE is suspected, then a well score should be performed. You get three points for clinical signs of a DVT. This is leg swelling and pain on palpation. This is because we know that 90% of emboli are from deep vein thromboses located above the knee, termed a proximal DVT, and we know that DVTs can dislodge and migrate to the lung circulation. An alternative diagnosis is less likely than a PE, gets three points, and that's why it's so important to take a thorough history and get a chest X-ray to exclude other pathologies. So with a PE, the chest X-ray is usually normal. Heart rate above 100 gives you 1.5 points. This is common. You might want to get an ECG and I'll talk a little bit more about what you might see on the ECG later on in the video. Immobilization for more than three days or surgery in the last four weeks gives you 1.5 points. We know that orthopedic surgery in particular is a risk for PE as shown in this case. That's why we usually say move as soon as possible after the surgery and do your lower leg exercises. Previous DVT or PE gives you 1.5 points and the presence of hemoptysis gives you 1 point. Malignancy gives you 1 point and we know having cancer predisposes you to PEs. So in this case, what was his well score? You know, I, had this, I had an operation so um, I'm pretty static most of the time. Do you feel your heart racing at times? Yeah, I do sometimes. I've got an Apple Watch and uh, it does beep at me. I get a bit of pain in my leg, sort of, I would say the lower down there. It's the calf, isn't it? It was nine because he had lower leg swelling and pain. He had a tachycardia surgery within the last four weeks and other diagnoses were less likely. A PE is likely if you have more than four points and if this is the case you need to arrange an immediate CTPA. If there is a delay in getting the CTPA then interim therapeutic anticoagulation should be given until the scan is performed. Now this used to mean giving low molecular weight heparin but NICE updated their guidance in 2020. They now recommend using an anticoagulant that can be continued if the result is positive. So this means a direct oral anticoagulant, a DOAC, such as apixaban or rivaroxaban. If a PE is unlikely, so that's four points or less, arrange a D-dimer test. And if this is positive, do a CTPA. But if the D-dimers are negative, then you really need to start thinking about other things. So in summary, the treatment for VTE is anticoagulant therapy, usually a DOAC. 
Of course, there are some exceptions to this, but I'm not going to go into that because then the, the video will just be too long. In terms of the length of anticoagulation, all patients should be on it for at least three months. And whether or not it's continued is very much dependent on whether the VTE was provoked or unprovoked. If the VTE was provoked, the treatment is typically stopped after three months. Provoked VTE due to an obvious precipitating event, for example, major surgery, the implication is that the event was transient and the risk is now gone. If the VT was unprovoked, then treatment is typically for six months in total. Just to be clear, an unprovoked VT occurs in the absence of any obvious precipitating event. So there's a possibility that there are unknown factors at play here, for example, a mild thrombophilia, making the patient more at risk from further clots. In terms of ECG findings, so we know that the most likely finding is a sinus tachycardia. But for the sake of exams, please remember that PEs can have ECG changes, namely S1, Q3, T3, which is a large S wave in lead one, a large Q wave in lead three, and an inverted T wave in lead three. In real life, this change is seen in no more than 20% of patients. You may see evidence of right heart strain, including right axis deviation and a right bundle branch block. I hope you found this content useful. In upcoming videos, we'll be diving into more scenarios. Check out our full video, a presented complaint that can be caused by many underlying pathologies. I will demonstrate a systematic approach to unpack the history. Stay tuned for our exploration of hemoptysis and exertional dyspnea to be released soon. If you have any requests for the next series of decoding diagnosis, leave a suggestion in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.